I really appreciate the Lord's blessing. Bless me with a good job. Uh, work for Uber Eats. Believe me, they say those places like DoorDash, Uber, and some of those up, up Grub, and some of them places, they say you can make a lot of money, and it is true. I'm amazed. I'm thrilled by that job. Not just the money, but the way I can deal with the public during the day, you know, or even into the evening. Um, I'm really thankful for that job. And I'm thankful for my new place to stay. I'm out of the Salvation Army shelter now. And I just want to tell this story. I just hope Brother Paul will be in here. I just wanted to tell him this. I Friday night was my last night there. So when I came in, oh, it was probably after 9, 30, 10, because I, I don't like getting home too early then. I, that's the thing. I might go home early now that i got my own place. <laughs> early still might be 7, 30, 8 o'clock, but still that's better than 9 or 10, right? Anyway, I went in the room where my roommates were, and I noticed my top bunk, man over the top bunk had left. I don't know the story, don't want to know. I looked over and told the other two roommates that I uh, got placed and it's official and everything, and this would be my last night. And I, they they actually rejoice with me, believe it or not. Especially the guy on the top bunk, he really rejoiced with me. And not only that, he rejoiced in this. He said, "Now I get the bottom bunk." <laughs> you know what? I'm happy you will. <laughs> if you got your Bibles, I'm gonna get right in the message. I'm still working on reaching the lost. I don't know how much longer because I'd like to try getting in a doctoral message or two, but I just want to do this at least one more time. I'm not saying it'll be the last or not. I'm just saying I think it, I would like to start doing some more doctrines. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. I'm going to read two verses this morning <clears throat> for time's sake. And how, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 20, 21. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, that have showed unto you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Personal evangelism illustrated in the lives of the apostles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for this morning. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to minister and to teach this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a man years ago by the name of John Henry Vassar. I doubt many of you know who he is unless you're well-read. Most of here this morning probably have never heard of him. But he was just an ordinary layman. When I talk about witnessing, it's not just a preacher's job. You know that? Amen. I believe a preacher should be an active witness, Brother Gobby. I really do. But I also believe the laity should be out here witnessing. And sometimes lay people have been known to do more for the church to get built up than some preachers have. And that's not even to reflect on the preacher. The preacher could be a God-fearing man who's out here laboring for his souls. But how many God-fearing laity have really been the backbone of the church, the one getting them in? He was an ordinary layman, limited education, rather retiring personality. However, when he began to visualize the worth of a soul was elevated by God, and he covenanted with the master, I'll give myself, yea, I'll give all there is of me to the task of soul winning. I'll tell you what, I think we all should do that. That should be our number one desire in this hour to reach the lost. I believe this is, should be our number one desire to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. I believe that's the thing, the, the commandment of the hour. Let me tell you why. I believe Jesus is getting ready to come any day now. I'm still the pre-trib camp and I believe Jesus could come now before I'm done. 
when we have souls in, with us in heaven, or we have a lot of blood on our hands. You know what he did? Preachers love to have Vassar to help them with, with revivals. They would even bring them into their communities to do nothing, to do not to do the preaching, but to do the personal work house to house. From door to door, he would go cheerfully and lovingly in the search of souls. Often he was insulted and ridiculed, but his disposition remained the same and his fervor undiminished. Can we keep our disposition, still be compassionate when they make fun of us, when they say harsh things to us? I don't know why I'm saying it, but I think I'll just add that to Are we going to allow a few people cussing us out, spreading lies on us because they don't like us witnessing, so they'll go out and say we're Jehovah Witnesses or they'll go out and say we're terrorists. Oh, when we're actually out to stop the terrorists, you know that? By getting them saved. But he went on. His fervor remained undiminished. Once as he and a pastor walked up a street from the depot, Toward the church, the latter made reference to a black ship, blacksmith's shop across the street saying, the man who runs that place is not a Christian. I hope it will be convenient while you are here to talk to him about Christ. I like what the man said, Brother Paul. You know what this guy, Uncle John Vassar did? He replied, it is convenient right now. I'm learning something even in my own, own life. Sometimes when I remember to do something, that's the time to do it. I don't know how many calls I had to make recently trying to get this apartment. I learned if I did it the first moment, even just leaving on their answer service, Brother Paul, because they would be late at night and there's no way nobody would be there. I found it better to do that and get the job done and say, I'll wait till tomorrow and it never got done. So that's how I'm learning. He immediately crossed over to the shop and within 10 minutes, the old smith, he had dropped the foot of his horse. He was shooing and was on his knees crying out to God for salvation. John Vassar was merely apostle-like in his service for our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we need to learn to grab the opportunities as they come. Because I'll tell you what, that man, you may say, well, I'll put it off till tomorrow. I think, you know, I'll, he, he, it might be better tomorrow for us to reach out to him. Tomorrow may never come. Tomorrow may never come. I heard about I read a biography of a preacher, doc, the late Dr. Henry Schilling. And I hope I got the, everything straight here. It's been years, but it just came back to me. He told the story how he, uh, <clears throat> he uh, one morning went to a bank. I think it was the president of that bank. He felt impressed the witness to him, Brother Paul. You know what he did? He decided to put it off for a later time. A few hours later, he saw that president earlier. He could have witnessed to him then and there. A few hours later, he got word that, that president committed suicide not long after Dr. Schilling left. Oh, he could have just reached out one time. He could have stopped the suicide. Kind of like another preacher I know, Reverend Lowther. He one time was driving by a house and God told him to stop and knock at the door. He knocked at the door and a lady answered. Turned out that lady was just ready to commit suicide, Brother Paul. We need to be led of the Spirit of God. They had a lot of elements in their soul winning the apostles. They were men of absolute devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, totally devoted. 
It says, Acts chapter 15, verse 26, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. As the apostle Paul said, Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me, neither can I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul didn't even count his life dear to him. He did not. Let's look at some of the things. We go in Acts, cha I mean, first, Second Corinthians chapter 11, some of the very persecutions he went through, a night, and a, a day and a night in the deep, he what was on five times, he was whipped 39 times, saved 39 times. He was stoned. People turned against him. He suffered at the hands of false brethren. I'm telling you, Paul was totally 100% committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so wasn't Peter. So wasn't John. Oh, I know some of you may point back to when Peter Denied the Lord that time. Well, listen, he may have denied the Lord, but he done some repenting, didn't he? The Lord, when he took, when he uh, resurrected, he told the ladies, go tell my disciples and Peter. And later on, on that shore, Galilee, what did he do? I see Galilee. Jesus said, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And who was a spokesman on the day of Pentecost? You know how our mindset would be? We would have John, because John was right at the crucifixion. But that wasn't God's choice on the day of Pentecost. It was Simon Peter. And I believe when he got the Holy Ghost, a lot of things changed in the life of Simon Peter. We need to be totally devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I like what... What Dr. Adrian Rogers said on his radio a few weeks ago, broadcast, he brought out the difference between commitment and a surrender. Yeah, I'm not against being committed to the Lord. Nothing wrong. But did you know there's an implementation with a commitment that you could go back? I'm committing myself to you. And then later on, you turn back. You know what the difference is? Surrender and commitment. Surrender is absolute. You throw up your hands and surrender. You're no longer your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify the Lord in your soul and body. I'll tell you something. We need to be that committed to the Lord or that surrender to the Lord. Absolute surrender. You don't hear that preach much anymore. I'll tell you what. I believe the church would be different if more people would surrender 100% to the Lord. They were not only men surrendered to the Lord, but they were men of humility. They were like John the Baptist. He must increase, but I must decrease. Those men were dying to themselves daily, not just physically, but, but to themselves as far as their, their uh, life. They realized that some of the stuff that they felt was valuable in the early days was no longer valuable to them now. I'm not against having a good job. Once again, I've got the best job that I ever had. Here am I, 62 years old, and have really ran into the job of fortune, so to speak. Really? The best paying job I've ever had, and I'm thankful for it, but the ministry still before that job I have. The Lord Jesus Christ's devotion is more important to me than driving those miles I do every day for Uber Eats. But I also believe whatsoever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. So that's what I'm trying to do, work heartily as unto the Lord and do the best I can for uh, Uber Eats, not because of them, but because of the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's how you should do it. Amen. Peter said, likewise ye younger, Second, First Peter 5, 6, 5, 5 and 6, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time.
I believe Peter was a humble man. He had to humble himself a lot after he fell that night. Oh, he never was totally perfect, but he was a humble man. That's why I don't believe he was the first pope. No, no. He never was a pope. In fact, I've often liked, you know, the Bible says he must increase, I must decrease. Read the book of the Acts. After Acts 15, you don't read about the Apostle Peter anymore. It was the Apostle Paul after that. The Apostle Peter actually wrote only two books, First and Second Peter. Some people believe he may have had a lot of influence on the writer of Mark, and a lot of what Mark wrote was things that Peter had taught him. Now, that, I believe that, but still, it was Mark the writer. The one who deserted Paul. But thank God, Paul, towards the last of his life, said, and take John Mark, for his prophet unto me, and to the ministry, we need more humility. We need more humility. Sad thing about humility is when you realize how humble you are, generally you lose it then. That's the truth. One of the verse I've been wanting to preach on for years, and I think I'm closer now than ever, is he has shown thee, O oh man, what does the Lord require thee, but to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God, Micah 6, 8. My trouble was as though it's the humility, it was the love of mercy. They were men of courage. They had holy boldness. Look on the day of Pentecost. Peter, who just, what, 40, 50 days earlier had denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, now just got the Holy Ghost, and he had power to witness with. He had authority. He had an enthusiasm. Why? Because Jesus baptized him in the Holy Ghost. And he was a bold man after that. <clears throat> I believe we all need the same boldness that Peter had. We need the same boldness that Paul had. Who in Acts 14, when, when uh, Paul and Barnabas were being worshipped by uh, those, those people... What did they do? Verse 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Saul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran among the people crying out saying, Sirs, why must, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth. And the sea and all things that are therein. I don't believe they were just doing it quietly, you know, like a little kind of pious. I believe they were fully Pentecostal that time. I believe they raised their voices warning those people not to worship us. Worship God. Amen. Amen. One more thing I think is interesting about the Apostle Paul. He either got worshiped or reviled. Because not long after he was being worshipped, they took him out and stoned him. And I'm of the camp, he really died. Because it was, I believe that's when he wrote, I believe he wrote about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That he actually was in heaven for those few minutes. But thank God. Amen. They were men of boldness. Amen. Naturalness. I like what Dr. Robert L. Sumner says. I could not help but be impressed while reading the book of Acts and studying the lives of the apostles. That naturalness was a strong characteristic with them. There was nothing put on, no sham, no dressing up to gain a supposed added advantage. In simpler terms, there was no hypocrite, hypocrisy in them. You know, the world hates hypocrites. Never forget when I first got saved how I'd go witness to people. What was one of the number one excuses, especially as a young Christian? Too many hypocrites in the church. Well, guess what? If there's one hypocrite in the church, that's one too many. I'll go this far. If the only hypocrite that's ever lived in the, been in the church world was Judas Iscariot, and there's none since. That was one way, one way too many. 
Because let me tell you, we don't need hypocrites in the church. Amen? The only way we need them in the church is so they can get saved and become the real. Amen. But they weren't put on. They weren't like the Pharisees and the religious leaders who prayed big flowery prayers to be seen of men. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, stand in the synagogues in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. For verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And I kind of like the parable of the, the Pharisee and the publican. That Pharisee, here he was. He stood, I like what it says, verse 16 of Luke 18. The, per, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Come on. You know what it tells me? He wasn't really praying to God. He was praying to be seen a man. If anything, he was praying to himself. May not consciously, but in reality. I thank God. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. First of all, let me tell you, there's another thing. I hope none of us are extortioners or unjust or adulterers or even as that publican was. But the way he gloated on it. I believe he was actually trying to belittle that publican. Fasting twice a week, I think some of us would do better if we would fast twice a week. Amen. Give tithes all you possess. Well, you better be paying your tithes. I'll leave it there. But I believe in tithing. I'm going to tell you why I believe I made it through the times starting around 2000. I mean, you're going to go far as I hit a blow period a few years ago. But one thing, I try my best not to forget the tithe. People say, I don't have enough money. I'm in debt. I can't tithe. That's the best time to be tithing. When you're at the bottom. So you know what? I kept tithing. And look where I'm at today. Sure, I, I was... I'm, I'm not where I'd really like to be, but I'm thankful for that house. I actually like it. It's a cute little house. On a, sits off of Main Street. It's got a Main Street address, but it's off of Main Street. I understand that through Uber Eats, but enough on that. He got up and he prayed that prayer. But look at the publican. Stand afar off, would not so much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this is what the Lord says. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every man that exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Because he humbled himself when he prayed. He acknowledged he was just a sinner, not even worthy of the grace of God, only just needing the mercy and the grace God gives. He was very natural, and God forgave him. Who knows, he might come back a week later, the Pharisee be saying that, and the publican could get up and say, but listen, I was all that a week ago, but the Lord has changed me. I've even gone back and paid fourfold everything I stole. So listen, the Lord forgave me. Amen. Concern and compassion. The apostles were men without exception. Men of compassion. They loved people. I acknowledge there's people in this world that have treated me bad. Sometimes I have to really pray, God, help me forgive. And as I've taught here before, I've learned, you, number one, you got to forgive. you got to turn all vengeance to God. And then you got to do what it says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, forgetting those things which are behind. 
I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling God Christ Jesus. We get those things which are behind and moving forward to that which is before. Oh, how many times if we would do that, we'd find ourselves better off. We need compassion. We need compassion. Some have compassion, making a difference. So you may have heard my message. I preached. I don't even know what happened to the man. I hope he's not dead, Brother Paul. I hope he's alive. Even if he's in a nursing home, I hope he's alive. God used one of the roughest sinners I met while, uh, while ringing the bell about three years ago for the Salvation Army to really show me the importance of compassion. Sergeant Humbug is what I call him. I don't even know the, real, the man's real name. That's all I can call him. The reason I call him Sergeant Humbug, he's got a Vietnam veteran hat on. He kind of reminds me of a rough old sergeant, rough on his, pe on his men, but I don't know if he ever got that high up or got higher. But I'll tell you what I do know. He was a soul in need of a savior. God really used that old sinner man, Sergeant Humbug, to realize how important compassion is. I'd say, have a great day and Merry Christmas. He'd say, bye, Humbug. He would cuss and everything. He was hateful. You know what? Jesus died for Sergeant Humbug, didn't he? If Sergeant Humbug is deceased, I hope he's repentant before he died. And you know what do me good more than anything? They get to heaven and there's old Sergeant Humbug walking up to me and said, thank you for being nice to me when everybody else hated me. <laughs> Thanks to you when I was in my dying in a hospital bed, I called on the Lord and he gloriously saved me. <laughs> I would love that. I'd love that. We don't know. I don't know where he is, whether he's dead or alive, a nursing home, moved or what. But I'll tell you what. We, we need to love the sergeant humbugs of this world because Jesus loved them enough to die for them. Compassion and concern. Earnestness. Sincere and intense conviction. It was stated that John Paul Jones, during the Revolutionary War, fought as the whole cause of the American liberty depended on him. That's how the apostles went witnessing to the loss, as if the world's conversion depended upon their effectiveness. That's how we ought to be. You say, oh, Brother Roy, I stumble and bumble, and I, I have a hard time talking to people. That's why you need the Holy Ghost this morning. Amen. Faithfulness to the word of God. Consider the key verses and how I kept nothing back that is profitable unto you that have shown you, have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be faithful to the word of God. We need to uh, get to know this book. And I like what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I've kept nothing back that was profitable. Can I tell you? I believe his whole cause was to preach all the gospel. But from Genesis 1.1, and I know Revelation had not been written at the time, but it had been to the last verse of Revelation because I believe Paul was a man of the book. He loved the word of God and his desire was to show people how to be born again. He wrote, what was it, thir I, I believe he wrote Hebrews, by the way. Oh, I think it was 14 of the, God, of the epistles. Can I tell you something? He loved God, and God used him greatly. Amen. In spite of his past. Amen. Dependence upon the power of prayer. You go through the book of Acts. What did they do? They spent time having prayer meetings. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and so they spake the word with all boldness. Holy Ghost leading. Barnabas gives us a good example, illustration of the 
cause. An effect of apostolic service. See what said of him in Acts chapter 11, verse 24. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much, much people was that to the Lord. We need the Holy Ghost, don't we? I, I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to say this. If, you don't have, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Ghost this morning. You say, oh, Brother Roy, I'm not qualified. It's not for me. If you're saved, it is for you. You say, what about these people who believe it went out with the apostles? I wish they'd study the Bible a little bit more detailed. They say, we don't study. I've read some of their things, and really, some of what they say is really illogical. Why did Paul write three full chapters on the gifts of the Holy Ghost and then say, well, now it's not for us today. How come in Acts chapter 2 they spake with tongues? Acts chapter 10, when they got the Holy Ghost, they spake in tongues. Acts chapter 19, three vivid at clear times. Then an implicit is the Apostle Paul in Acts 9 and also in Acts 8, you know how I believe they knew they got the Holy Ghost? How Simon, what Simon the sorcerer saw? He saw men and women speaking in tongues as they got the Holy Ghost. This morning, this is important that we receive the Holy Ghost. People say, oh, Brother Roy, can I make heaven without the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Can I shock you? I can't go to the local grocery store without the Holy Ghost. No, I'm not preaching that you'll go to hell if you never receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is between you and God. I don't believe it that strong, but I believe it's strong enough that you need the power and so much more in this day and age if you're going to be an effective witness. I have one more thing to say. I didn't get this far, and I really wasn't going to, but I wanted to deal with this one issue, one example of the apostles' witness in Acts, in John chapter 1 through 42. 42. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpret, by interpretation a stone. The reason I want to bring this up before I close. You talk about witnessing as though the whole conversion of the world depends on it. When Andrew preached to Simon, his brother, he really didn't know who he was witnessing to, did he? He probably thought, this is just my brother. Thank God, I want to get him to Christ. That's good enough right there. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen after they get saved, do we? But I'll tell you what happened after he got saved. God rose up a mighty man, didn't he? The apostle Peter. I'll tell you what, God had his hand on him. God used him on the first, on the day of Pentecost. He was greatly used to God, seen people saved, healed, and delivered throughout the Asian and European world. He was a fireball. As the old song goes, Peter was a fireball, amen. Peter was a fireball, amen. I don't know, he may have really been. I think he was, but that's neither here nor there. But I'll tell you what I do believe. When, when John witnessed to him, he probably never at one time thought that man's going to be a preacher. I asked her, I got back, found out where Joy Stewart Walker was after years of I finally was able to get a hold of her. And there was a question I asked her. I really thought maybe the Lord kind of dealt with her about this. 
I asked her, Sister Joy, did you ever at one time think or the Lord revealed to you that I was going to wind up being a preacher? Her honest answer was no. But you know what? Regardless whether they become a preacher or just a good lay, layman or some good prayer warrior, really, we knew more prayer warriors than we do do preachers. We really do. How many churches have been built up more because of a prayer warrior than a preacher? Quite a few. I'll close with this story. A preacher was praying and asking God why, about the success of his church. And the Lord told him, I want you to go upstairs at a certain time. And he went upstairs at a certain time. And there he was, a young boy with Down syndrome, crying out to the Lord with all of his heart. A Down syndrome person. Somebody whose mind may not have all been together. But there he was crying out to God for souls of men. And God told him, that's why you're so successful. Because that young guy praying. I believe that. I believe that. Well, thank you all for your attention and God bless you.